My name is Jim Milky. I'm a volunteer at Snow Mountain Ranch, YMCA of the Rockies, Colorado, USA. It's really great to be back at the YMCA again. For most of my adult life, I've had the privilege of living and working in some of the poorest, most remote and underserved places in the world. And it all started for me at the YMCA. The Young Men's Christian Association, one of the oldest and largest movements for youth in the world, reaching over 58 million people in 119 countries. The YMCA works to bring social justice and peace to young people and their communities, regardless of religion, race, gender, or culture. A six-week internship with the YMCA's in Sri Lanka, and I was hooked. And now, 35 years later, I'm still out in the world, having lived and worked in over 20 countries throughout the Asia-Pacific region. And you can do this too if you like. There's a host of opportunities for world service out there, for meaningful work, challenging jobs, fun, even life-changing, life-changing life experiences. Whether it's with YMCA or with schools or university programs, with humanitarian aid agencies, or other faith-based organizations that work throughout the world. So please join me now as I share with you a little bit of my overseas experiences, maybe give you a little taste of what it's like living out in the world. Let's see the world with the YMCA. I think you'll like it. Talofa Samoa. All right, we'll be with Samoa in a few minutes, but first we're going to start with my very first assignment, which was in Sri Lanka, and then we'll be coming into Samoa in a few more minutes. Okay, here we are in Sri Lanka. As you can see, the year is 1982, and the YMCA in Colombo is already celebrating its centenary celebration, 100 years of service to the nation, even way back in 1982. So the YMCA's have been well established around the world starting in the 19th century. And you can see speaking here is the president of the country at that time, Jawardene. One of the fun things about living in these small countries is that you get to meet some very interesting people, including some of these dignitaries. And this is a rather uh, embarrassing picture of the ugly American. I had received no <laughs> cultural training before going overseas. It was really hot there. I'm staying here with a host family in Colombo who are just lovely and they seem to uh, be very nice to me despite my 1970s shorts and uh, <laughs> the shirt almost falling off. One of my jobs at the YMCA though was uh, taking urban youth, some of these kids who were in disadvantaged youth in the inner city, taking them hiking and camping in the jungles of Sri Lanka. And these are some of the kids we went with. On this internship program I went with one other American Michelle is here, pictured here. She stayed for six weeks. As I said earlier, I stayed for about six months. I was having so much fun. And we took these kids on some adventure trips in the interior of Sri Lanka. It's a gem of an island, beautiful country. And here we are, uh, the kids have caught some fish for dinner that night. Um, some of them were so gung-ho, they liked to lead the, lead the pack and I'd give them a stick to, to, to shake the bushes so the snakes would go away. We had cobras and vipers up there. But they'd run away pretty much, although one kid woke up one night with a snake inside his sorrow. But anyway, we had a lot of fun. This is just a picture of the inner city in Colombo. Again, a lot of these pictures are from the early 80s, mid 80s, and this entire program covers about three decades. So things are changing, but this is some of the scenes from the inner city of Colombo. You see elephants walking around. I remember flying in when I first came to Sri Lanka and looking out the window at all <laughs> this place, I was wondering what the YMCA had sent me to. 
But here we are in Sri Lanka. If you want to get your work teeth worked on, you can go to a dental technician or a dental mechanic. Also, uh, just find a seat wherever you can. <laughs> the vans would be pretty packed for public transport. Just a few pictures from around the country. A tremendously beautiful country, lots of history. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site called Sigiriya. There had been a, a fortress city up on the top here um, many hundreds of years ago. And you can actually climb up to the top on these on this very rickety ra railing here and come up sort of a hair-raising uh, staircase up the side of that cliff. And inside the cave, there were some caves where there were some very well-preserved maidens here, these frescoes they call them from around the 5th century AD. Very well preserved and beautiful paintings. One of the highlights during the year in Sri Lanka is the Parahara festival. Sri Lanka has four major religions. The, the majority are Buddhist, and then followed by Hindus, and then Christians and Muslims are quite smaller uh, communities. And here we have a Buddhist festival where the Buddha's tooth, one of the Buddha's teeth, is enshrined here and paraded around with 80 elephants, 8-0, for a whole week, day and night. There's all kinds of dancing and, and festivals. Once a year, this happens in August, and then every month at the full moon, there are smaller parades uh, throughout the country. Just to give you a little lay of the land, this is Sri Lanka, a little teardrop-shaped island on the southern tip of India. And we're gonna, while I was there, and I'd like to advise anyone, whenever you go overseas to work somewhere, by, be sure to travel the region you're in. Uh, it may take many hundreds of dollars just to get back to where you are. So take advantage of your region. When I was there, I, I took a trip, a holiday up to Nepal. I went trekking around Annapurna and uh, came down all the way down through the subcontinent of India for about a 10-day trip, riding the trains and visiting places along the way. Took the ferry boat back to Sri Lanka. It cost me all of about 30 US dollars. It was really cheap. And also, it was 1982, just prior to this very devastating civil war that hit Sri Lanka, started around 1982, the next year, and only finished just a, not too long ago. But again, you can see some of the sites along the way. This is a familiar site, the Taj Mahal. Here in Durbar Square, in Kathmandu, Nepal, these beautiful old buildings are very badly damaged now. There was an earthquake here a few years ago. And this is an, op an opportunity for anyone to go to a place like Nepal, going with agencies like Habitat for Humanity, for example, to help rebuild people's homes after a disaster. You can see some of the architecture here. After I finished in Sri Lanka, I applied for a program called the Young Professional Abroad or World Service Worker Program with YMCA of the USA. And it's sort of like Peace Corps in YMCA. You can uh, go for two to three years in a particular country and they give you training before you go. Uh, this is a program unfortunately that no longer exists in the Y but it's been decentralized so you can still go for um, overseas opportunities but from individual YMCA associations uh, that have relationships in different countries. Um, but this was so neat because we each we all trained together but we all went to a different country. Like he went to Egypt she went to Japan, she was in Uruguay, Argentina, uh, Paraguay, she went to Jamaica, he was in Liberia, I don't remember where this guy went. But they're all different countries. This couple went to Saipan in the Northern Marianas, the YMCA's, and I went to the YMCA in Western Samoa, which at the time was the youngest YMCA in the world. It had only been operating about six years. So because I had been working in the YMCA, Jefferson County YMCA, just outside of Denver, um, as a youth program coordinator, and I worked many summers up at uh, YMCA Silver Bay, YMCA of the Adirondacks. I was able to qualify as a young professional abroad, and instead of $300 a month, I got 400 bucks a month. And this is all money that the YMCA has helped us raise for our two to three year project overseas. Here you can see where Western Samoa is. It's right out in the middle of the Pacific. Hawaii is up here. You can see Australia, New Zealand. We're going to be visiting a number of these Pacific Islands here throughout the 
presentation. But anyway, I had uh, a really tough time. It was a hardship post. They sent me down here for three years in Polynesia, South Pacific. And you can see here, typical Samoan houses have no walls and they're just leaves for a roof. And they have a woven type of mat that they can lower during uh, the rains and then raise up uh, when it's not raining and, and just to let the fresh air in. You can see the outer reef here. This is very typical of Pacific Islands where you have a, a barrier reef that keeps the big sea life out and the inner lagoon is shallow but tons of sea life uh, here for like octopus and shellfish and a lot of stuff that people can collect on the reef. But these fishermen do go outside of the reef and that's where they catch the larger uh, like sharks and rays and this big of this thing. Here's the logo, Western Samoa. This is a very typical type of tapa design, they call it, from the Pacific. The YMCA building had been built with money from the local Rotary Club. This building is built with no nails, all built with local, local materials. And you can see here they're using coconut twine, for example, to lash the building together. Here you can see the building is complete in the background. Some of our office staff in the headquarters, and you can see some of the programs the YMCA in Samoa was offering. And again, YMCAs are autonomous. We all have the wonderful triangle of promoting healthy body, mind, and spirit. But every YMCA has its own board of directors and can respond to its very specific community needs. And in a place like Samoa, their, their needs were, were grassroots development, basically. So they, we had a mechanic school, a carpentry school, out in the village and in the city. Rural clubs exported taro. Taro is a root crop, it's their staple food in, in many parts of the Pacific. And they would, the YMCA would help uh, local farmers find markets to sell to the Samoans who live in places like New Zealand, Australia, American Samoa, and the United States and other places. So also, and leadership training, of course, we do throughout the YMCA, farm management training, rural clubs, kava export. Kava is also a very important cash crop in the Pacific and a central uh, to many of the traditions. It's a, it's a beverage used for traditional ceremonies as well as just for sitting around at night talking story. A lot of times in these villages, there's been no electricity and it's, a very nice social time just to sit together. Men and women drink kava. The churches are very uh, uh, interested in promoting kava as an alternative to alcohol. We have, of course, like in many places, uh, alcohol abuse uh, is a problem. And kava actually doesn't have many of the problems that alcohol has. It doesn't have a whole lot of physical downsides from drinking kava. It's actually been made into a pharmaceutical called Kava Kava that's used as a tranquilizer and sold in, in pharmacies uh, in the West. And also, interestingly enough, Kava is a muscle relaxant, so there may be uh, some violence or even uh, sexual violence uh, in, in cases of alcohol abuse, but with Kava, um, since it's a muscle relaxant, there's no chance. So it's, the churches love this. They're quite, and it's a cultural thing and it might as well promote a, a cultural thing. Also it's grown locally and a lot cheaper so the families aren't spending a lot of money on alcohol. Social survival skills and prepare for New Zealand. A lot of Samoans emigrate to New Zealand and also other countries like Australia and American Samoa but they have no, interest, no uh, understanding of how to live in the West. For instance at home it's not a problem to build a rock oven right by your house and bake a pig, but you might not be able to do that in your front yard in, in uh, New Zealand, this kind of thing. So anyway, to give you an idea, the layout of what we call YMCA rural clubs that are basically village-based YMCAs throughout the country on the two main islands of Savai and, and Upolu, the uh, main islands uh, that are uh, inhabited in Samoa. There are two other smaller islands that have populations on the small populations, Monono and Apolima. Monono Island, we'll visit here in a few moments. I used to go spend my weekends there. I was adopted into a local Samoan family there and used to spend weekends with them. You can see again here, the year is 1985. So we're, this was again one of my early assignments. Samoa was very influential on my whole the way I lived my life actually. Very, very special. Um, close to my heart. This is how 
uh, it looked inside the YMCA Center in Bia, the capital, with chairman of all these village clubs then would come in, say, every month for meetings to make plans to see who would get uh, different uh, support for various projects in the communities. The villages could take out loans to do small projects. And also, uh, their young people could par participate in some of our training programs. This is the carpentry training, small motor mechanics training. We would do a lot of training in the villages, though, actually, because people didn't have much money to be able to travel into town, or they're busy working on their farms. So these guys, and we do trainings in the evenings when they, after they finish their day's work out in the plantation. So they may have been learning about farm management or how to use credit, for example, this kind of thing. Of course, leadership training took place regularly throughout the country. Wherever we went, YMCA is providing leadership development for our young people. This is what uh, taro looks like. And again, there was a lot of support for growing more taro because the YMCA could provide help the, market, help the farmers uh, find markets for them. So therefore, they produce more and then they could sell more. This is the taro root that's being sacked up in these sacks and headed off for a container, probably headed for a place like New Zealand or Australia. Village gardening, promoting better nutrition even in this very sandy soil where we could. Uh, small loans were provided to help start small businesses. So villagers could, these YMCA's could take out a loan, get a business started, get some training on how to run a small business, and then be able to pay back the loans later. This guy's small business was fishnet mending. So he was the person you came to if you needed to um, mend your, your fishnets. This is a, a very sobering uh, issue. The, in the Pacific, when we were there, one of our board members was uh, the mortician in town. And he began to notice there were lots of young people coming in uh, to the morgue that died. And it turns out, um, that, and this is still going on in the Pacific, it's been a long road that has to do with rapid social change, a lot of uh, uh, cultural factors, uh, fairly complex, but there's a high rate of youth suicide. There's basically an epidemic of youth suicide in Samoa when we were there, when I was there in the early 80s and the 80s. And this is a retired teacher the YMCA hired to go talk to young people as well as their parents about the dangers and warning signs. If they saw someone or the parents might see that their, their son or daughter is uh, going into something called musu, maybe a, a withdrawn uh, depression state. It could be a, a forerunner to uh, suicide. One of my Samoan brothers in my adopted family actually uh, committed suicide. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very, very tragic uh, thing that's happening. But the YMCA was one of the leaders in, in starting to raise awareness and then handed over the project to the Catholic Church who have been running counseling services um, for this kind of thing. On a happier note, this is a national park where we would have outings for our youth programs. And of course, YMCA youth camping, this is a very American thing. I was a young American volunteer, or, and I, I kind of brought this idea to Samoa. It was new for them, but, and the kids loved it, but the parents, for the most part, would rather see their kids learning vocational skills and job skills. We taught a lot of life skills, life you know, we included the Red Cross, and they learned uh, you know, swimming, and first aid, and, and uh, all kinds of life skills training, but as well as a lot of fun. But again, it's something to keep in mind when you do go overseas uh, to work in another culture. It's very important also, this is Willie, he was the program director, and he was my counterpart. And you'll see throughout the presentation, wherever I've gone to work, I always have a local counterpart, somebody I work with who can help me learn how to work and, and you know, provide something useful in another culture, as well as uh, someone who I can share, hopefully, some things. And when I leave, uh, this person or that counterpart will remain, and hopefully the organization will benefit as a result. These are... Uh, to Fijians from the Fiji YMCA, they were doing a uh, YMCA um, exchange program. You can see here, he's being uh, served a coconut cup full of kava. This is a typical uh, traditional welcome beverage. And these are Melanesians. The Fijians are Melanesians. They're dark complected with fuzzy hair. They're Pacific Islanders. And then 
Samoans are Polynesians, brown skin and wavy hair. And you'll see some of these tattoos. Lots of uh, Pacific Islanders um, do, uh, have tattoos. It's a very traditional practice. And these guys are big macho dudes. They really like doing this kind of thing. The Fijians were, were teaching the Samoans how to mill lumber from their own timber using chainsaws. A lot of them have a lot of trees on their own family land or their community land, and they can then cut up uh, timber, cut the timber and, and mill it into lumber for a much lower cost than if they went to the sawmill. These guys got a, a loan for a cattle ranch. See, there's some backcountry dudes here. My job uh, was to go around to all these village clubs and, and report on their projects and put together a newsletter uh, to help raise money and raise support for the YMCA, also to raise awareness for other communities that might like to join the YMCA and do this kind of thing. So here we are at a typical toll booth in Savo with a diligent toll collector there. Uh, again, my job took me around the countryside. I had a little dirt bike that I could travel on and eventually got a, a four-wheel drive Jeep uh, so I could take some more people back into our village club uh, areas uh, reporting on our projects. This is very typical in these villages that it would be one way that the villagers could uh, raise some money uh, by having a toll uh, for the roads that ran through the village. Whenever I was overseas throughout these years, my brother Dave has, has taken advantage of my being there and he, as a school teacher. He used to come to see me every month, every summer, I'm sorry, for about a month. And here we are in Samoa, we'd spend a week in the village. Whenever you go out in the villages, they usually send you home with a nice big roast pig. So here's a nice pig for us to enjoy uh, eating for some time to come after being out in the villages. But Dave definitely took advantage of uh, wherever I was, and you'll see more of him during this presentation. Here we are, with, uh, here I am with Willie. I'm getting ready to, to leave. I think uh, Samoa is very sad to have to leave. I was only there... Uh, two and a half years and then another six months in Fiji YMCA but um, this is uh, Patello our carpenter instructor who had just gotten his full body tattoo and agreed to let me take some pictures of him this tattoo is very traditional uh, for Samoan men this is a boat here and all this design is pounded in with wild boar teeth it's a uh, quite painful process and they use the soot from like the top of a Coleman lantern, they jam it into the skin, and then they soak in the ocean maybe three times a day for about a month uh, while this design is healing. But it's a very, very traditional practice, sort of a coming of age kind of thing for men in this, in this Pacific Island society. Here you can see the main highway going around our island. You know, it's small places and it's uh, uh, very simple roads and, uh, of course, spectacular, beautiful tropical scenery. This is just uh, on the beach. This is um, here with my girlfriend and, uh, and then with one of her friends. And I put this in here for another reason, too. In Samoa, there was a, uh, um, in the 1930s, there was an anthropologist uh, named Margaret Mead who came to Samoa and studied adolescent sexuality and produced some very sort of somewhat controversial research about uh, youth sexual behavior in, this, in Samoa. But anyway, she's written a book called Coming of Age in Samoa, and it's very interesting. It was interesting living in Samoa um, in the 80s, 1980s, after um, this research had been done in the 30s. Anyway, lots of beautiful uh, beaches and uh, uh, seaside. I spent my lunch hours here um, on this big open lagoon with reclaimed land. You see the rocks have been built up here on top of the reef in this little shelter. So you can swim here and the outer reef is still far away so the big sharks and other dangerous creatures aren't coming in. You have this beautiful aquarium to uh, swim in. They also had a local beer that was brewed under German management uh, via Lima. Via means water, Lima means hand, so water in hand fairly high alcohol content. I also did, at a later date, some research with the World Health Organization and AUSAID, the Australian Agency for International Development, on alcohol in the Pacific, doing research on alcohol content and per capita consumption, this kind of thing. Uh, quite a bit of uh, 
high consumption in some of these Pacific islands. And we'll just leave some all. We're going to move to Fiji now. YMCA Fiji, this is the, the director of the Y and his wife at the time. You can see that this is a traditional kava bowl. And you can see how central kava is to these societies with YMCA is actually sitting in a kava bowl <laughs> for their logo. logo. And in, in, in Fiji, half of the population are the descendants of the East Indians who were brought in by the British to grow sugarcane. But these are the people who now control the businesses. They run businesses like taxi businesses and all kinds of shops. And, and whereas the, these are the East Indian kids coming to daycare. And then Melanesian Fijians are traditionally farmers and fishermen. And they don't do business as much. So it's a very, it had been a very nice balance where the Indians, Indo-Fijians are called, would be doing the businesses for the economy. And then the Fijians typically in government too would have the political power. But in recent years there's been some problem, uh, according to the Fijians, that, that it's also difficult for the Indo-Fijians. They're not allowed to own land and there's some difficult issues. But uh, at one point the prime minister um, elected was an Indo-Fijian. In the past they'd always had a, a Melanesian Fijian uh, prime minister. Uh, but then so you have a balance of power, political power, and then economic power. But now uh, it's gotten to be uh, difficult, and there had been a military coup some years ago, and it's, you know, they're working it out. But these are all remnants of the colonial age, colonial era. The YMCA also builds houses for rent using their lumber, their milling techniques. This is Viliamu, he was in Samoa in the picture earlier. Check out that chainsaw, <laughs> you know. And he's showing us how they built their homes using their own timber in their community. This is a traditional Fijian home called a bure. You can see it has walls. But in most of these Polynesian or Pacific Island homes, when you go inside, uh, this one's different because the women are weaving mats and they're going to sell them at the market. Um, but when you go inside these houses, there's almost nothing in there. Uh, in these societies, it's almost more honorable to give stuff away. Uh, than to accumulate things. So that's why in Asian societies, for example, you see families accumulating wealth by the family. But in the Pacific Island communities, uh, they don't accumulate wealth that way. They're busy uh, giving it out to the community. And these women, though, are major um, contributors to the family income because they make handicrafts and they sell them at the markets. Meanwhile, the guys are busy pounding the root of the kava so they can have a nice kava session that night. So, see this kind of thing. The kids are wonderful everywhere. Same thing, if you ever get lonely in any of these places, just find some kids and they'll cheer you up. As you may be aware, the Fijians, uh, once upon a time, were, were uh, cannibals. And they would uh, capture their enemies and lay them out on this particular platform and bash their brains in to kill them and then cook them in a hot rock oven like they cook their pigs. And they called it long pig. <laughs> And the warriors, of course, would get the legs and the arms, and the chief would get the brain and the heart, and the women would, it's typical, they get all the leftovers, the toes and fingers and this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, was in the past. You may remember um, the bounty, mutiny on the bounty, when um, they sailed a, an open boat through these very treacherous waters, not only reefs, but um, islands filled with cannibals uh, in the Fiji Islands in those days, and they managed to survive. There's an interesting uh, museum uh, piece in Suva, in the capital of uh, Fiji. Uh, it just shows a hat, a broad-rimmed hat, and a pair of leather shoes. And that was all that was left of the first missionary that uh, came to Fiji and got eaten. <laughs> so anyway, sort of a colorful history here for Fiji. Let's get a picture of the islands here now. This is Hawaii. Of course, West Coast, USA, Australia, New Zealand, Samoa is down here. We're going to go up into the Tokelau Islands, uh, Tonga. Uh, we're going to be visiting a number of these islands and going up into the North Pacific and out in the Southeast Asia eventually. Okay, who's this guy? This is a picture of a Maori uh, warrior doing the haka. And the haka is a war dance tradition uh, to the Maoris in New Zealand. They're the traditional, they are the indigenous people, they're the Polynesians. And 
they like to do, if you've seen any of the rugby matches nowadays, the uh, All Blacks are the team for New Zealanders and others, even Australia, I think too. Many uh, sporting teams will line up and do this haka dance, this war dance, uh, before their matches. And it's uh, still keeping the tradition alive. He's taunting his enemy with his tongue as if this is the most tender part of his body and he's, he's taunting his enemy even with the most tender part there. But anyway, just a little bit of the culture from New Zealand. Once again, travel the area you're in. Uh, I have a number of Samoan friends who lived in New Zealand, some YMCA friends, and it also it's just a beautiful place to go for trekking and outdoor recreation. So I managed to take uh, several vacations down in New Zealand when I was there. Also, when I was in Samoa, I slept for three nights on the deck of this freighter, which is now at the bottom of the ocean. It hit a reef and it's, it sank. But in the old days, it used to service these islands called Tokilau, Tokilau Atolls. And an atoll is where you have, once there had been a volcano rising up out of the ocean, and then it collapsed on itself and created this big lagoon with a ring of islands all around it. And there's a country called Tokilau with three of these atolls. Each of the atolls has 500 people living on it. So there's only about 1,500 people in the whole country. And you have to take this boat, it's the only way to get there, for a three-day voyage uh, to get there. And the boat goes once a month, if you're lucky, and brings supplies uh, to these islands. And here is a Polynesian toilet flushing twice a day with the tides. Very traditional, of course, as more tourism comes in to the region, these toilets are being replaced with regular flush toilets. But traditionally, this is the, the Polynesian toilet. And you gotta be kind of rugged. They bring your own tissue because uh, they use coconut husks uh, for toilet paper. And again, once again, travel the area you're in costs many hundreds of dollars to get to wherever you've gone to work overseas. This is uh, on the trail, the root burn track in the South Island of New Zealand. I managed to take several trips to New Zealand for uh, recreational outings as well as visiting some of my Samoan friends and some other YMCA's in New Zealand. This is along the Milford track. You typically have to book a year in advance to get on this trail, but I happen to luck out the day I was going by the trailhead and they had a cancellation so off I went. Okay, off to Papua New Guinea. Now when I finished my work in Samoa and Fiji, I wrote a proposal for another project and I realized that there was a need for partnership building, we call it, in the Pacific and Asia area where we bring together YMCA's from wealthier countries who can, that can support in the YMCA's in the less wealthy countries. So I started off in Papua New Guinea gathering information, gathering information for the next two years. I lived out of a backpack, traveled throughout the Asia area, hit about 15 countries, and including the Asia area office. Papua New Guinea has 500 different languages spoken, all these tribal groups, fascinating area. This is a Sing Sing festival taking place in the highlands. Every year there's two festivals, one in Mount Hagen and one in Goroka, where the different tribal groups gather for singing and dancing and, and partying as well as showing off their various tribal uh, outfits. We stayed in the village here. My brother was traveling with me again at this point. Stayed in a tree house in this village. It was quite chilly. And follow on to another village, this uh, gentleman in the yellow shirt was a social worker who brought us to his village and we were able to sleep a very warm night in this roundhouse. There's a fire in the middle and I don't know how many bodies smashed in there like sardines, but at least we were warm. From Papua New Guinea, I continued on into Bali where it was again, we had some very interesting uh, cultural shift, uh, beautiful food. Uh, you could eat, even the cigarettes smelled good because they've got cloves in their cigarettes. Bali is the Hindu enclave within Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, population-wise, but Bali is, is, is Hindu, and this is a, a funeral pyre that is being uh, burned after a large parade in the funeral. Climbing the volcano Batur, Mount Batur in uh, Bali, 
It's a volcano that's rising out of another caldera in the lake below. It's kind of a smoky climb. Lots of live volcanic activity in Indonesia. This is Tana Taraja. This is in the central part of the island of Sulawesi. Very traditional looking boat shaped houses. You can see here they're having some sort of a traditional, some kind of a sacrificial ceremony here in this village. This is a Buddhist temple, Barabadur. Even though Indonesia is primarily uh, Muslim, we do have these other pockets, certainly the Hindus in Bali, and this is a, a Buddhist temple, and of course the Christian community, the YMCA's, are active in, in Indonesia. This is some of the YMCA staff in Jogjakarta, which is on the eastern end of the island of Java. We'll be showing a map here shortly so you can see a little more of where, where I'm going. The YMCA in uh, Jogjakarta, their, their project primarily is for education. In Indonesia at the time, the public schools were not very strong, and the private schools, fairly expensive. So the YMCA was providing a kind of middle ground for families that couldn't, for, couldn't afford the private schools, but could get a better quality education uh, than the public schools provided. Of course, there are kids everywhere. Many of these countries, uh, half of the population may be under the age of 25, so quite young populations. This is a family I was staying with in Maluku area, the Spice Islands. Some of Jacques Cousteau's favorite dive spots are here. This is where there are 16th century forts from when the Dutch and the British were duking it out, fighting over the spice trade. And these people would cook this wonderful food with cloves, uh, cinnamon, and nutmeg, and just about everything. It was really delightful. And again, you need to, traveling in some of these backwater areas, you need to pick up a little language. These folks didn't speak any English, but Bahasa Indonesia is not a very difficult language, so I picked up more and more languages I spent time in the country. Very delightful time, though, staying with families. There weren't any other uh, major hotels in these areas, so you just stayed with families. This is on Bunaken Island in the north end of Sulawesi. Uh, beautiful area, famous dive spot. Really great diving here. This is Mount Kilabalu, the highest mountain in Southeast Asia. It's about 12,000 feet high, uh, rising from sea level. Uh, it takes a couple days to climb the mountain. You have to sleep one night on the mountain, and the second morning you're climbing the final part by ropes and ladders. And then you're on top, watching the sunrise, looking out over the steamy jungles of the island of Borneo. This mountain is located in Saba, which is part of East Malaysia. Sipadan Island, a very beautiful and amazing uh, oceanic island, rising nearly a half a mile from the seabed. Uh, half of the island is used for uh, green turtle nesting, is protected. The other half of the island uh, has several scuba dive outfits. Diving is some of the best uh, in the world here, it's, the marine life is some of the richest marine life anywhere in the world. Uh, you can see here the in, inside of the reef is all uh, shallow lagoon, and then you can go snorkeling all around. There's plenty of reef life, but then once you're outside of the reef, it's the deep sea. And then you see all kinds of hammerhead sharks and rays and the big deep sea life. It's a fascinating area. Again, some of the beautiful tropical uh, waters around uh, Sipadan. Coming to Singapore now, Singapore is a lovely place that you have not only the East Asians, like these, these women are East Asian the Indians, and you also have Malays, as well as Chinese and Europeans. So you have all these kinds of foods. And here I was invited to a Hindu wedding, which is really cool, these beautiful uh, saris, the beautiful women wearing these, these very, very rich, colorful saris. And then traveling from Singapore, I'm heading up into Thailand. After I was in Singapore, actually I was in Singapore for about a month. I was waiting for some funding hopefully to come through for continued work in the Pacific. But in the meantime, I actually did a little modeling. Uh, they had lost all their Caucasian models. It was around Christmas time. So I had someone take some pictures of me and I picked up a few extra bucks along the way uh, modeling some clothes in Singapore as a Caucasian model. Once in a while, anyway, the best way to travel, though, I think, is just taking the local transport. And here you can see 
taking a fishing boat up the coast of Thailand. And it's important to note when you travel in these places too, it's, it's, you need to keep an eye on to your valuables and it's, it's very common to just wear a, a very simple pouch with your passport and in those days we carry traveler's checks or with your, your credit card just to keep them safe so they're not lost. Here we can get a little lay of the land here. We we're in Papua New Guinea coming into Indonesia, coming through Maluku, the Spice Islands, over into Sulawesi. This is Tana Taraja with the boat shaped houses up to Bunaken Island, coming down here to Bali. Joe Jakarta is over here and coming through to the YMCA in Jakarta as well. Spent some time up here on Sipadan Island and climbing Mount Kinabalu here in Sabah. There's also preserves for um, orangutans up here in the island of Borneo. Um, finally coming through Singapore, up through Malaysia, and we're going to come up into Thailand, Burma, and over here in the Philippines, Vietnam. This is PP Island. It's was voted one of the 10 most beautiful islands in the world. It's just a couple hours south of where I live in Phuket in southern Thailand. The beach on the far side, uh, you may have seen the movie The Beach, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, that was filmed here. It's, this is a rather old photo, but it's much more built up now, but it's still very spectacularly beautiful. Island. This is a little bit of the lay of the land again now. We've come up through Indonesia into Malaysia, my home here is in Phuket, and PP Island was just south of Phuket, and we're going to come up here into Thailand now, into the Golden Triangle. I'll tell you about that in a minute. This is what the northern city of Chiang Mai looked like in those days with the Siklo. I'm sorry, with the Trishaw here, the Sam La, and then we have the Golden Triangle. This is the Mekong River, the Mekong River. Over here is Burma. This is Laos, and we're standing in Thailand, and it's called the Golden Triangle because this part of the world is one of the heaviest producers of opium in the world. In fact, Burma is still number two production just behind Afghanistan, so it's called the Golden Triangle. You can see here we're in Burma now. This is in Rangoon. You see a young, um, a small person here, actually a grown man, who's here sitting at the base of this reclining Buddha, massive reclining Buddha. And again, traveling out through some of the ancient temples, going down the Irrawaddy River to Bagan uh, in Burma. I was working again with the YMCA's. In those days, you could only get one week visa. And even the YMCA was operating on the black market. It was very, very hard times in those days. Over here, we're in the Philippines now. Northern Luzon, very beautiful mountainous area. This is in a tribal village of the Ifugao people. They're an indigenous people and I was staying with them for several days and exploring some of the area and some of the caves. I had been in the YMCA in Baguio in the north and took a trip up here to these spectacular uh, rice terraces almost rising to the sky. This is in Banawe and then there's another beautiful area in the mountains called Sagada and this is all in the northern part of Luzon, the northernmost island of the Philippines. Carried on to work with the YMCA visiting uh, in Manila, in the Amita area, in, in downtown Manila, and down into the Visayas Islands where there were a number of YMCA community development projects uh, that we could visit and see there. Some of the kids, this is a typical village schoolhouse in the Philippines. This is how you get around in the Philippines. This is a, what is known as a jeepney, the American-made World War II vintage, vintage jeeps that they've either rebuilt or kept running amazingly. And they run all over the country and through the cities as well. We're changing the flat tire here. As you can see, some of these people uh, were actually sitting on the roof. Uh, can be fairly crowded transport, but it certainly is affordable and that's how you get around. And they're really rugged and they can manage these rough roads. And Jackie took me around, she took me around, she's from this area actually, from the Visayas areas, and she was able to take me to all these uh, YMCA uh, community development projects in that area. We're standing here on Boracay Island, which in those days was just pristine and beautiful, and, and unfortunately in recent years the island has been closed, actually just this past year was closed for some months because it's been overdeveloped and needed time for the environment to recover. Uh, from too much pollution, but it's back open again, and again, very beautiful country. 
From the Philippines, I continued on to Hong Kong, where the regional office uh, for Asia, the YMCA's, is located in Hong Kong. Also uh, visited Macau, the oldest European settlement from the 1400s in Asia. Portuguese were here in about 1400. Took a side trip, a side trip up into Yunnan, up into Guangdong province of China. And just a 10 day trip here, I took with my brother again. Uh, we went up to this place called Zhaoqing with these beautiful karst uh, formation, these mountains that are throughout this region. You see this kind of dramatic um, limestone formations and mountains, and then the beautiful temples around it and rice fields that we could uh, visit. 10 days in China. Um, cost me a total of about $15. In those days it was quite cheap. Coming to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial in Taipei in Taiwan. The YMCA in Taiwan does, uh, has a number of programs, of course, quite an active YMCA, but one of the big projects is English language training. A number of the Ys in Asia have English language schools. This is the seaport of Busan in southern Korea, South Korea. I took a boat from here. Uh, I had been working with the Seoul YMCA. I stayed with them for about four months uh, in Korea. But uh, there was a conference over in Kyoto, Japan. So I took a boat from the south of Korea, from Busan, over to Kyushu Island in the south and continued on up for a few weeks just touring in Japan, Kyoto, uh, Shikoku Island, Hiroshima, uh, Peace Park, and these places, and then back into uh, Korea. This is my friend Ben. He was volunteering from the YMCA of Ghana in West Africa. And he's giving me this look again like, well, here we go again. Uh, Korea is very, a very mono-ethnic uh, society. Basically, everybody's Korean. And they don't often see either Caucasians or black people. So whenever Ben and I would go out in the street, the streets, as you can see, were pretty well packed with a lot of pedestrian uh, activity. Lots of public transport, it's quite easy to get around actually. However, uh, whenever we'd go out on the street, uh, the, the people would just sort of find a way to try to get away from poor Ben, so <laughs> streets would sort of open up. But he had a great attitude and he was a great guy. And otherwise, in Korea, it was just a wonderfully, wonderfully welcoming, warm uh, society. The YMCA was just uh, stellar in its uh, taking us throughout the country and showing us their programs. This is uh, in the south of the country called Jeju Island or Jeju-do. This is a youth center that was built by the Japanese YMCA's as a gift to the Korean YMCA's. And this is also a popular holiday spot at some of the few swimmable beaches in Korea because it's in the south, it's warmer. It's also a popular honeymoon spot. And therefore, this here we are, we're coming down from the YMCA in Seoul. And throughout the island, there are all these fertility guys all over the place, so I think they're, they're trying to encourage the uh, newlyweds. Okay, we're going to move on to Thailand now. I've been with the YMCA for about a half a dozen years uh, in Asia, the Pacific, and finally in the States, uh, fi finishing up with this partnership building project uh, with the National our YMCA of the USA in Chicago, um, providing them with all those details. Uh, but they kind of ran out of stuff for me to do, so I joined a nonprofit called Tom Dewey Heritage that was running a health project in the north of Thailand. And I had spent a fair amount of time in Thailand working with the YMCA in Chiang Mai and had picked up uh, some basic Thai language. So that's partly why they asked me to run this project because they needed someone who could communicate clearly with the, uh, with the Thai Ministry of Health people up in the, the provincial district in the uh, local health centers. This is the back of my business card. It's in quite a remote area. From Chiang Mai, which is a major northern city in northern Thailand, you could take a bus to Chiang Rai. This is how I tell my visitors whenever I have people come to visit. This is how you get find us. <laughs> From Chiang Rai, then you take another bus to the district town of Mechan, and you take a smaller truck to Pasang, a smaller village, and finally the back of a pickup truck to this fork in the road where you try to get up this 13 kilometer dirt road, which was actually washed away half of the year in the rainy season, and come to our village, Turt Thai. It's right across the river from the town Ban Hinpak, which just means broken rock. And we were kind of like the, 
wild west out there, right on the Thai Burma border. Our hospital had no electricity or wa running water. These are my staff. Uh, most of these staff were illegal aliens. They didn't have any citizenship in Thailand or Burma because they're border people. They just uh, had not been established with birth certificates and this kind of thing because it's a very remote area. It was one of the last parts of the the uh, of that our district um, in Thailand to become uh, developed, uh, partly because uh, the border is so porous that Thais didn't want to develop it too quickly because it was too easy for illegals to come into the country um, and therefore the road for example was not paid, electricity had not come in yet, but we were the only health uh, service within a very large area and uh, our nonprofit was there for five years working with the Thai Ministry of Health and I was the last director for the last year and a half before we handed it over to the Thais and we were training health workers and providing community development uh, services, putting in water projects, all kind of neat stuff in that area. And here we were just having a turnover. The two medical doctors, one was leaving, the other was coming for six months. Same thing with our nurse practitioners. One was leaving and new one was coming in. And then I stayed kind of longer term because I was the liaison officer for uh, working directly with the Thai government health system. There you see the triage area. These are, we served mainly uh, ethnic minority groups in the area. My hospital staff, among the staff, there were nine languages spoken, but we used Thai language for our general communication. This is a TB patient, typically. This would be a, an ambulance. Uh, we just would hire local truckers to move our patients down to the lower level health system, health centers, when we could not manage them ourselves. Here you can see the IV bottle, the oxygen tank, and these Truck drivers oftentimes were running drugs as well. It was a big opium producing area, heroin producing area, and the drug, drug traffic ran right through our village. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, drug trafficking going on, but we also uh, could utilize these drivers and they'd take our patients down the lower levels. If the driver, however, thought the patient might die on the way down, they'd refuse to take them. They'd think that would hex their uh, truck. This is our road in the rainy season. It's pretty rugged. For about half of the year, um, these mainly two-wheel drive trucks would be trying to get up and down the mountain. These guys were hunters who were bored by a wild, wild boar, and our health staff basically uh, were able to save them. They're being sent down to the lower. They later gave us some of the meat from the uh, boars. Uh, thank you. But again, you can see here they're literally lifting a truck out of the ruts to allow the lower trucks to come up the mountain. Sometimes we'd bring in medicine by horseback or just on foot. Every year, rainy season, our bridges would wash away. There was so much deforestation and the bridges would eventually wash away. And fortunately, the one bridge that did not wash away was a good solid one that was built by the opium warlords <laughs> so they could get their drugs and their money and do their business uh, uh, from the highland area. One of the more lasting impacts of our project was the immunization program. Uh, lots of these people, particularly the kids, you'd see people, kids coming in with diphtheria. You know, we normally don't see that in the West. We try to jab all of our women of childbearing age with tepestoxoid. They even trained me, my nurses trained me to, to uh, give some immunizations so we could um, really uh, reach as many women as possible, even out in the rice fields. Nutrition education in the local schools, again, basic, basic public health outreach. Water projects, this is working with the district health officer and the village headman. The villagers would take, typically take loans out so they could, with their rice crop, so they could eventually have the PVC piping uh, coming up from the low, lower areas. And these kids are enjoying a bath in the village for the first time. The low-lying areas tend to have a lot of malaria. And again, they like to live up in the mountaintops but without water, uh, that was also a health issue for them all. And it's much more convenient now, and they're loving it, having water in their villages. Just a couple happy, healthy-looking mothers and babies. Did a lot of work with uh, on mother and child health, promoting better nutrition, breastfeeding, of course. And uh, oftentimes you see these kids with these lovely hats that they've woven for them, but they 
typically would not take them off to bathe the child's head. So if you take this cap off, it might be a very, uh, unfortunately, very infected, very painful looking scalp. So we tried to, again, a lot of health education, basic health and hygiene education for these people in these communities. This is a village headman showing off a, a snake skin he had. This guy was clearly a soldier. He's got tattoos all over his body that he believes would keep uh, bullets from penetrating his body. He's smoking just a cigarette here with a bong, but here's the real stuff. The opium was throughout our area. There was a lot of CIA activity during those days doing opium eradication. I think the immigration officers thought I must have been CIA as well. I looked a little too military at the time, and here I was um, running a health project, running a hospital, and I was not a medical doctor at the time. I only had a degree in recreation. <laughs> so, and I spoke Thai, <laughs> so I was kind of a little under suspicion for the immigration people. But anyway, and a number of the communities either cultivated opium or others were the consumers and were quite a mess. Therefore, uh, we did a fair amount of uh, community-based opium detoxification. These are all opium addicts in one village, mostly men. Some of the wives got addicted as well, and then some of these guys are my staff who were working on this project. And they, we put them to work. They're, they're building a fish pond here. They all get to stay at the edge of the village in a, in a special sala, a special shelter, because they were quite ill going through their withdrawals. This is part of a government program where we put them on a regimen of 45 days gradual reduction of methadone. And once they were done, they could start the program over again if they wanted to. It was free. It was in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, the late 80s. And the last thing we wanted our people to do is to begin getting into injection, uh, injectable drugs and heroin. This kind of so community-based opium detox. Whenever we went out into the communities, we had to bring uh, military, the border police with us. Um, I think really it wasn't that much of a big problem. There were opium warlords flinging mortars at each other sometimes, fighting over the opium trade routes. But and these guys were very jolly fellows. They were great, but sometimes a little too drunk and carrying a lot of live ammunition. So it was a little, uh, a little bit worse. But anyway, we had great times, a lot of fun going out on these field trips. We'd go for a week at a time, fly out in the military helicopters to the border and then hike back for a week um, with the malaria team, the TB team, tuberculosis, with the provincial and district health officers, and of course our, our uh, border police escort. And of course I ran the hospital like a YMCA. Uh, most of my staff were 19 or 20 years old. Here we are having a, a contest of Miss Samoa Hill Tribe, or Miss Hill Tribe Universe. <laughs> And they're all having a good time. So we would have parties whenever we could, actually. We didn't have electricity at night, so uh, we'd have, you know, somebody would have a guitar, we'd sing a song, or, in fact, unlike the YMCA, we did allow alcohol at our parties, so we'd have warm beer, uh, because there was, again, no refrigeration, except uh, we had uh, one for our, some of our vaccines, but uh, that was run off, the, it's not an electrical uh, refrigerator. So anyway, we, a lot of these folks, too, were far away from home. We saw a lot of tragedy to people coming in with cerebral malaria uh, sometimes. I remember one family had walked for days from inside Burma. Two kids died in the way. The third one died when they got to our hospital. But we also were able to save a lot of lives and a lot of, uh, do a lot of good in the area. And the local residents depended on our health services. This is uh, some of my nursing staff who had won a volleyball tournament in the local community, um, an annual sports festival they held in our community. And what are we eating here? This is, um, I'm here with my translator Lucy, who is uh, from the Aka tribe, a very traditional tribe, but she had been raised in a Catholic convent in Burma. So she spoke very good English, as well as about a half a dozen of the border languages. So she served as one of our main translators and, and helped me also with translating, even though my Thai language was pretty good, it was important to have a, a good translator to make sure things are clear. And here we are eating chicken feet. Barbecued chicken feet was about all we could get in the evenings. We had one little restaurant in my village, and at night time there'd be little bonfires going, barbecuing these chicken feet. And I guess if you put enough hot sauce on, you don't notice the toenails or the gristle so much. 
And my brother is visiting again here, and he's not so sure he's going to eat these chicken feet. And we'll get ready to say goodbye to our Highlanders here at the Turd Thai Highland Health Center in Northern Thailand in the Golden Triangle. When I finished that project, I moved down to Bangkok, and I, was, I knew I needed to go back to school to get graduate studies, but I wasn't sure what to study, whether it would be public health, social work, or business. So I went around town and visited a number of the nonprofits based in Bangkok to find out what those people had studied to get into their positions in, in their nonprofits. And I eventually uh, uh, met up with the director of the Catholic Relief Services uh, here, Mike McDonald, who then uh, said, look, Jim, why don't you take a year um, delay for your graduate studies and come and work with us for a year. They were running refugee programs for the Cambodian refugees at the time on the Thai border. So I came in with Catholic Relief Services for that year, uh, working as the office manager and finance officer. We used to take our weekends at a place uh, where we had floating bungalows and it would be near the bridge over the River Kwai, we call it the River Kwai. These are some of my uh, friends and colleagues from the office, Rick and his uh, future wife, and we'd bring our girlfriends up here for weekends out in the countryside. But ultimately I had to give up all this fun lifestyle in Thailand and go back to school and I was given a scholarship. Uh, I think the federal government and the state took pity on me for being a volunteer for nearly a decade and I managed to get a scholarship to do my master's and my doctoral studies at the University of Hawaii and the School of Public Health. My master's research for the uh, MPH degree was up in Alaska. I uh, was promised uh, student housing, so here I am in Alaska. It was a great summer working with Alaska Native communities uh, throughout the state. Uh, Bill is one of my buddies. He's half Athabascan Indian, half Russian. He was doing his master's of public health in Hawaii as well, and we're down here at his village in Nilchik in the Kenai Peninsula. This is in the eastern, lower eastern panhandle uh, with the Clinkett uh, tribal groups and their totems. I was flown all over the state by bush pilots to visit all these remote, many remote uh, native communities uh, to do the research on the impact of federal and state policies on Native American health. The next year I was beginning my doctoral research and I spent a summer in Thailand. This is my research assistant. I was working with the Thai Red Cross and we did research in this largest slum in Thailand. It's outside of Bangkok. It's called Klung Thud. And we're, it was uh, the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And without planning on it, I got very involved in AIDS research. And some of the research we did was with street children, child prostitutes. Um, did some of the original research like AIDS, orphans, all these. I published a number of studies, some of the very early studies on HIV and children, publishing to, together with my colleagues at East West Center in Hawaii and my other colleagues here in Thailand at the Thai Red Cross. The following year, I, I was based in this village in the north with this public health nurse who was just stellar. She was the youngest nurse on the team in this district. It was a district outside of Chiang Mai, very, very heavily hit with AIDS. There was a crematorium just across the road from us where there'd be a parade every day bringing in another corpse to uh, cremate. Um, these districts were hard hit. As many as 30% of the pregnant women in these districts had HIV. And they would have had just one sex partner, their husband. It was very, very heavy stuff. And this uh, nurse, a wonderful person, a wonderful friend of mine, she's, we stayed here for nine months um, doing our research up here. Um, I was also staying, also staying with us was another American, a young student, doing her research on, on rural sociology. We were all Thai speakers. Uh, Gaulak did not speak much English at the time, but she was very central to uh, helping me actually finish my doctoral research in Northern Thailand, uh, studying the issues of abandoned children and HIV in Northern Thailand. Eventually managed to finish the degree in, in my doctorate in public health. And after two years of diligent searching for work, um, I was unable to find any work, even though I'd been in the region for nearly a decade. I spoke several local languages. I had doctoral training and technical research training. Anyway, it was um, didn't happen, so I decided to go sailing. And one of my roommates 
had been doing his research in the South Pacific in the Marquesas. He's an archaeologist, Pacific archaeologist, and he scored a little 26-foot steel hull sloop for a song. And we, he single-handed it up through Cook Islands. I'll show you on the map here. He was down in Society Island. He was in Marquesas doing his research and bought this boat from a couple who had just sailed it around the world and they were heading back to Europe to start their family. So they sold it cheap to him. He got through the Cook Islands and over to Samoa. And I joined another one of our friends and we flew around the islands of Tongan, cruised Fiji, put the boat up on the hard for the storm season, flew back to Hawaii. Next year came down one more glorious season of sailing throughout Fiji. Eventually sailed the boat down to New Caledonia and sold it for twice what we paid for it. So we had fixed it up and had a wonderful time. When I was in Fiji, eventually I got off the boat and I met this woman who was the project officer down in UNICEF, Fiji, who needed, um, who was able to hire me actually as a consultant for about six months to help set up this regional training workshop on health promotion to prevent alcohol and other drug use among youth in the Pacific. This um, Jeff here is a, a specialist on alcohol issues from Australia. And we had, again, a number of local colleagues working on this training program and then regional delegates, people from about 14 different Pacific Island nations coming from youth ministries, youth culture and sports, or education, or health ministries. And these were the young people who were tasked with um, addressing what is, in many places, a serious problem, alcohol abuse. And trying to, the main drug drugs in the Pacific were alcohol and tobacco at the time. And, um, so we were here having our alcohol-free beverage, beverages uh, during a break in the, in the conference. We also had a, an open bar in the evening, so we could have alcoholic beverages, but um, it's a very tough, tough issue in the Pacific. One of the other uh, projects I was doing while I was in, with UNICEF in Fiji, one of my friends is the author of, some, of the Lonely Planet Guide to Fiji and Tahiti, Rob Kay, and he asked me to do some research um, to update his travel guide and I happened to be doing research in, on Kava throughout the eastern part of Fiji. So I was in some small village areas and I met this guy who had actually gone through the outboard motor training school for the YMCA in Fiji about 10 years ago and was still doing that as his business, repairing outboard motors in his village. And it was really fun to see some lasting impact some of the YMCA programs are having in these communities. We'll bid farewell to Fiji right now. We're gonna head back into Southeast Asia coming over to Cambodia. From Fiji UNICEF, I was recruited up into Cambodia and joined the staff in the UNICEF Cambodia in the mid-90s. It was also during the time when they were having their peak, probably the worst AIDS epidemic in the whole region. And my job, I was the project officer for AIDS, so it was quite a challenging job. It was also in the aftermath of the uh, genocide from the Pol Pot years, the Khmer Rouge, there were very few educated people left in the country to work with in government, and lots of the population were quite low educated, low literacy. So you'd see these very explicit kinds of messages for low literate groups here. You can see a medical doctor reminding people to wear a condom uh, every time. There's commercial sex was was rampant, it was along, along with trafficking of women and children. So it was quite a tough scene, but whenever you get depressed, like I said, you find some kids and they'll cheer you up. And of course there were plenty of kids there with great energy. Some scenes from Phnom Penh, the capital city, this is back in the mid-90s. It's dramatically changed now, much more modernized. But when I was there, it was pretty uh, rugged still. A lot of uh, broken uh, systems for infrastructure. Pol Pot had planted a lot of coconut trees through town, trying to turn the society into a rural uh, Paradise. It was a really terrible tragedy. And this just shows some of the scenes. Here's a typical uh, situation. This young gal has been uh, rescued from a brothel, and by one of the working with one of the uh, nonprofits. There are many, many agencies in Cambodia, uh, humanitarian aid agencies, and providing training like this for this young woman to have a new uh, craft, a new skill for her livelihood. This is what the countryside looks like, and Cam much of Cambodia is pretty flat. Again, very explicit reminders uh, for the AIDS situation. Even we got the police, who are typically um, involved in the uh, not only 
um, getting kickbacks from the brothels. The brothels are illegal, but the police are kind of corrupt, and they would be getting either money or free sex to allow the brothel to stay open. And the Ministry of Health, that's some of what we brought in from Thailand, from the work that I had done in Thailand, and we had actually helped to turn around the epidemic by instigating, initiating this program called 100% Condom Program, where the Ministry of Health sat down with the brothels that are illegal, the police that were fairly corrupt, and switched it around so that the police would shut down a brothel that was, if it was caught not enforcing condom use. So brothels loved it. They put a sign up saying, hey, we're 100% condom brothel and we're clean. And we actually, uh, it's part of some of the strategies uh, to help turn around the epidemic. We did a lot of community-based care, including, in, including the monks and the temples, which were very supportive as well. This is an inland lake called the Ton Le Sap. It changes its depth depending on the season, very dramatically. Here's a school that is floating. This is a UNICEF-supported school floating on pontoons because in the rainy season, the water level rises dramatically and then goes down again in the dry season. Here's just inside one of these schools. And this is a school that's on land. You can see here, the dry season, you have to walk a couple flights to get up to the school. In the rainy season, you come right to the top here by boat. Very dramatic. Uh, changes in the level of the lake's water. These are some Khmer young people who were working with us at UNICEF to help come up with appropriate messages for their peer group for AIDS prevention. And then putting together these AIDS messages for various campaigns throughout the country, also helping out with research in the communities, trying to understand how the community is understanding the epidemic. Whenever UNICEF did well baby clinics, we'd always sneak in some AIDS education as well. This is some of the, uh, the Navy, uh, Khmer Navy. I was able to join um, one of my colleagues from World Health Organization, a malaria guy, and I was the AIDS guy coming from UNICEF, and we joined uh, the Admiral here and his uh, contingent to bring the malaria guy, brought bed nets for these guys. They all had malaria out there, and also treatment medical treatment for them, and then I was able to bring condoms because when they go on their leave, uh, these are on offshore islands where these guys are based, and when they go back to the mainland, the mainland is just one big strip of brothels. So again, we wanted to make sure they were prepared with enough mosquito nets and condoms. Okay, from Phnom Penh, we're going to move to Vietnam now. I was on a project here with the um, Australian government. Um, about 22 million Australian dollars over a six-year period, uh, working in four provinces, two in the central region, two in the south. I was one of a team of four Australian consultants. I was the only American on the team. They referred to me as the ethnic minority. What it's looking like in the Delta, in the south, a beautiful country, very lush, a lot of water, a lot of boat traffic, uh, uh, of course, lovely fruits and vegetables. Um, very rich part of the country. It's a very big rice producing part of the country. And here we are now just coming to some project specific uh, information. This is some of the information materials that the project is producing. This is a mother and child health project. We refurbished hospitals, clinics, uh, working in these two provinces. I'm sorry, in these four provinces, two in the south, two in the center. Uh, major focus on essential, obst essential obstetric care, addressing the issue of high maternal mortality out in the outlying villages. We all, the project also trained on communication skills for health workers, for health promotion, on uh, basic, very basic information. This woman is mixing oral rehydration solution. She's learning how to use this. This can be a lifesaver for a baby with diarrhea. Sadly, much of the groundwater in the south of Vietnam has been um, damaged and is not usable anymore for drinking thanks to the, uh, uh, since the American War. And this is what the Vietnamese referred to the American and Vietnamese conflict. So the rain catchment containers here typically would not be enough to carry them through the dry season because now they can't use the groundwater. So village communities 
the village projects were made available for these communities to have um, bigger water catchment tanks. So this is a health worker in one of the community people with a new water container. This is a typical scene. This is a, a toilet out in the rural area in the Delta. You drive through here in the morning and you see people kind of someone squatting in there reading the newspaper. And then over here to the left by the house, people are washing their clothes and their dishes and maybe brushing their teeth and then they wonder why they're all sick. So the villages themselves came up with proposals. They were trained as part of the project to do their needs assessment in their communities and coming up with priority needs and certainly one of them is for better sanitation and here they are putting in a pit, pit toilet uh, in this village. Uh, another project is uh, women's savings groups. They would come together, maybe get a loan from the project and then come up with a priority issue uh, addressing better nutrition for their children. A lot of times it was safer water. In the mountains, we were able to drill directly and use the, use the groundwater because in the mountain areas in the central part of the country, that was, that was quite fine. But you did see a number of these water projects. The villages in the project were able to propose uh, and then get some funding to come up with some water projects. We worked also in very remote ethnic minority communities. Here is a picture of an ethnic minority woman who's been trained as part of the project to take her notes and do research in the project to come up with the priority needs um, for the health of their families. This is part of a process called participatory rapid appraisal. And again, the project provided training in this. And it was interesting, many of the uh, male doctors in the health system were quite suspicious, thinking, oh, these community women, they don't have much education. They're not going to be able to do this, but in fact, they're the ones who look after the family's health. They're sharing problems that they have in the community, and they trust each other. They know each other, so they can do their own research and come up with project proposals. And then the project really wouldn't have gone anywhere without these people. These are the key trainers from the provinces and the districts we're working with. I worked directly with Dr. Blade Tree, who was the master trainer, and then he would train his province and district trainers. Moving down to the district then, these trainers would work in teams, a provincial trainer working together with a district trainer for better quality training. And they train in their districts for these frontline health workers. You can see here maybe some familiar faces. Here's Ho Chi Minh, Uncle Ho, over here Karl Marx and Lenin. So again, it's still full on communist government, socialist government, uh, but they have uh, literally now, I think Vietnam is one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia. Here you see again during a training session on PRA, some of the health workers are learning how to map their communities, identify the resources they have, and then come up with what is still needed in order for them to reach their goal. These are community health volunteers. They don't get any pay but they, in many places, get paid in kind, and they're very important to the health system. Many of the health clinics out in the outer villages uh, may have just a few health workers to manage thousands of people in their community, so they re rely on these people who can then help them uh, in terms of informing pregnant women to come in for their antenatal checks, making sure their kids are immunized, this kind of thing. And here I am being inducted into the Communist Party, not really, but it's a typical scene for opening a workshop in one of our provinces where we would have the provincial health director, this is Dr. Quinn, from, this is in Kwangai province in the central region, and the district health director here. You can see many women also in high positions in the health system in Vietnam. It's very interesting and very, very productive. Typical uh, health message here for low literate populations. And again, if you get, ever get lonely or depressed in any of these situations, just find some kids and they'll cheer you up as usual. They love it. They don't see foreigners very often and they kind of go nuts. So it's a lot of fun. Here's some happy mothers and babies. And this is a typical scene after one of our weekly uh, workshop in one of the districts. Here's the district health directors uh, giving me a, a gift of thanks here. We're having a lunch together wonderful food, 
Um, need to be sure though, in Vietnam, a lot of places like Vietnam, you need to get your work done in the morning because there tends to be a lot of alcohol at lunchtime and afterwards and you're pretty well shot. So, but it's all part of relationship building which is very central to working together in other cultures. This is my assistant Tweed, Dr. Tweed. He's one of these very, he's a wonderful friend of mine, a great, great friend and we worked, we had a great time working together. He's one of these very uh, gifted uh, people in Vietnam. He's not only a, a medical doctor, he's a qualified lawyer, and he's also a community development specialist who speaks fluent English. And you see a lot of this in Vietnam, a lot of these very highly qualified individuals. And Tuyet was, was very central to, to the success that we had in the project. Even though my Vietnamese language was pretty good at the time, um, all of us on this Australian team, we had an Australian team, uh, three Australians and I was the only American, and again we relied on our national officers to help us not only with translation but also how to learn how to work within Vietnam and within the health system there in Vietnam. Typical scene for getting around in the Delta, we have ferry boats, but in recent years you see more of this. This is a beautiful new bridge that was built by the Australian government as a gift to Vietnam. And you can see opening day here, uh, everybody coming out and this is happening very quickly. Vietnam is changing very quickly and uh, it's a very exciting place to live and to work. This is along the central coast near Da Nang and China Beach, a famous surfing beach in certain times of the year. Typical scene with uh, Vietnamese schoolgirls wearing their traditional Aozai or Aoyai. I don't know how they keep these these uh, dresses clean, driving riding around those dusty bikes, but they, they do. Another very common scene throughout the country, this is a memorial, a war memorial um, from the American Vietnam conflict. Uh, during that war, about 55,000 American soldiers lost their lives and more than three million Vietnamese were killed in that conflict. So you see these memorials everywhere. Now coming down to Saigon, this is a typical traffic snarl in Saigon during the rainy season. This is my landlord in Saigon, Mr. Ngap, a wonderful guy. He had been in the Southern Army and had spent subsequently 14 years in re-education camp up on the Chinese border. And after he was released, he came back down to run a kind of a small rooming house in his family's French villa. And we all, I, I lived there with them and it was really fun because I got to hang out with not only some of his family there but other people who were renting rooms there. And it's, I've always enjoyed living more locally actually with local people as opposed to uh, many, many foreign consultants uh, rent in these more gated um, enclaves that are very, very safe, very clean, but a little bit sterile and also more expensive. So again, this is fun and also I got to, I'd be, we'd be doing everything in Vietnamese. It was a lot of fun. Here you can see I'm just preparing for another party. We also always had a lot of fun things going on. Mr. Ngap was a typical Vietnamese. He rented out every spare inch of his house there to to boarders in his, in his rooming house, so even his kids had to sleep in the kitchen cupboards actually. <laughs> so, but we had a lot of fun, lots of good times there. And very high energy, Vietnam's a great place to work, <clears throat> very, very upbeat place, forward looking culture. After I finished that project, I moved down to Phu Quoc Island, which is an island off the southwest coast of Vietnam, and I rented this beach bungalow for a hundred bucks a month. Stayed here for two years. It was absolutely delightful. Um, you get a feel for where the Phu Quoc Island is off the southwest coast of Vietnam, not far from Cambodia. Just a few scenes from Phu Quoc Island. And my Vietnamese was pretty good at this point, so um, I could easily get around here. There weren't too many foreigners. Uh, I did stay the first year with my friends who ran a pearl farm, the Phu Quoc Pearl Farm. And here's some more neighbors. Uh, Marie here is a Viet Q. She is from Vietnamese, having lived in France. And she's come back to Vietnam to build a tourist bungalow, kind of a small resort area. So we're having a 
having a little lunch here. Typical scene here at Fuquak Island, beautiful uh, paradise in, uh, in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. We're going to jump over now to the South Pacific. Um, following on from some of these longer projects, I've been doing in recent years some consulting for uh, groups like UNAIDS, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, and these kinds of groups. So we're here coming to Vanuatu. These are typical Bia Belong You Me, Me Want and Tusker. This is Pidgin English that's used many places throughout Melanesia and South Pacific. Again, some scenes from Vanuatu. Here you see where Vanuatu is on the islands. Hawaiian Islands are here in New Zealand, Australia. And here we are in Vanuatu. We will visit a couple islands here doing research again uh, for some of the projects funded by UNAIDS. Pentecost Island, we're going to go here eventually. But this again, I'm just here with one of the head men in the village. And as usual, uh, here's my local research assistant, Jaylene, who took me all over the place for these interviews. And, and again, very necessary and of course lots of fun to have a local research assistant take me around to do the work. Pentecost Island, you got the original bungee jumpers. These guys jump off these towers with vines tied to their ankles and just bounce just moments before hitting their head on the ground. The country of Niue, I spent a few weeks here as well advising the government. It's probably the president's car here. There's only 1,200 people in the whole country. This is Niue over here. It's a Polynesian country. You can drive around in the island in just about an hour. And again, very beautiful place, uh, inviting lagoons. You want to go swimming uh, wherever you go with a nice protected reef. However, Nui is famous for having one of the largest concentrations of banded crate water snakes. And the venom of these snakes is literally 10 times as strong as a king cobra. So it's a little bit daunting thinking about swimming with all these snakes. They're very friendly, they come around you and bounce off of you and stuff, but their mouth is <clears throat> actually too small to take a bite or to inject you with their venom. So they really, they're pretty harmless, even though they're potentially deadly. So anyhow, we survived some swimming with the banded crates. Coming up to Palau in the North Pacific, I was also advising the Ministry of Health here on some, some more projects. This is a very famous dive area, as well as um, lots of relics from World War II, um, sunken planes and this kind of thing. I've also done work with the Asian Development Bank throughout the Mekong region. This is my research assistant, Soprak, in Cambodia, during one of our, our major regional communicable disease control project involving six countries bordering the Mekong River. Now, who are these people? These people are very special. We'll just take note here, we're now in the, the we're in Samoa at the Apia Yacht Club. This is Fala, this is Manono, and this is Masi. And then here we are back in the day when I was a YMCA volunteer back there in the mid 80s. It's lovely. This is Manono and Fala and Masi. So here we are. Here we are a few years ago and now about 30 years ago <laughs> back in the village. When I was staying in the village, spending my weekends with my Samoan family, again, I was adopted into this family. Here's Wheela, the village chief, and Imoa there passed away now. But again, there, you can see all the kids here. Fatio, she lives in New Zealand with her family now. And this is how we would go to church in the mornings when I was there on the, on the island. A little more of the family here. Wheela told me he had 14 kids. I could hardly keep track of them all. My girlfriend, Emmy, was also adopted in the family because we'd come out there together often. She was a policewoman in town. She actually got uh, bonus pay because she played in the marching band. Uh, the Samoan police don't carry firearms, they just carry billy clubs. And maybe once a year for Independence Day, shoot off some weapons. So here we are out on the island. My friend Gary was a Peace Corps volunteer who um, actually introduced me to this family. And was there with the American Peace Corps, one of my best friends there. And we all are, would come out to the family uh, on the weekends uh, when we were free. Lots of fun. And Wheela would dress us up, it was fun, to dress us up in these coats and ties, these old bozo ties and stuff, for church on Sundays. And, and it was quite a, quite a special event. 
And here's one of my favorite pictures with Manolo, my, one of my young Samoan sisters. She'd take me by the hand and walk around this island. You could walk around in an hour. There was no electricity in those days, just four little villages, sandy little path going around, no dogs or cars on the island. And then here we are today. It's lovely. She's got about four or five kids of her own. She and her husband live in Australia now. But there we were back in the day, and here we are now. Very lovely. And it was so much fun. Here are some of my Samoan sisters on that trip just a few years ago when I was working in Samoa for, for some consulting. And here we go. Manon over her husband. And a little bit of a nice time together with the Apia Yacht Club um, while I was there on that assignment. It's so nice. And of course now we're all in touch on Facebook and Messenger and stuff. It's a lot of fun. This is just a, another uh, consulting project. I was working with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Eleven nations represented here. These are some of the top scientists I got to work with um, facilitating a workshop, putting together a rapid assessment and planning tool so each of these countries could better monitor and evaluate their AIDS programs in their countries. Coming now back to Thailand, this is a national park, Khao Sok National Park, not far from where I live in southern Thailand. You can stay in these fun floating bungalows, about five or six bucks a night. They give you a kayak, they feed you fish from the lake. This is one of my friend Mitch, he, he and his wife were teaching English out there after the tsunami, the Asian Indian Ocean tsunami back in 2004. They were teaching a lot of the orphans uh, there. This is a national park nearby as well called, called Sarin. You can only stay in tents out here. The Mokan sea gypsies live out here. They, they live out on the water. Again, this is a national park, about an hour and a half motorboat ride from the mainland. Very beautiful, spectacular. This is a Buddhist meditation center where I practice meditation on a regular basis, going anywhere from a few days to three weeks at a time in, in silence and being learning and being taught uh, by these, these monks here. And a lot of these folks, I typically be the only American, it's this center is all in Thai, but there are a number of meditation centers in Thailand where it's taught in English and, and even some other languages now. Just a scene from my home in Phuket, in southern Thailand. Uh, I actually had to take my hammock down a few years ago because it's, I couldn't get out of it after lunch. I kind of needed to get a few things done. But a very peaceful setting um, in a fishing village on the northeast coast of Phuket in southern Thailand. And it's a complex of, of units that are managed so I can come and go. I'm kind of like the backpacker in the rich guy neighborhood, though most of my neighbors have nice yachts and I can help them sail their yachts, but I have a, a kayak. This is a pearl farm on one of the islands just out in front of where I live. And this is relaxing at home. Uh, again, very peaceful place and um, sun, sunrise side of the island. Very beautiful uh, setting. This is looking north from my island. Uh, I like to do a lot of bike riding around there too. And if you've seen the movie Man with a Golden Gun, it was filmed up here, James Bond. And they even have an island they call James Bond Island take tours up there. This is looking out from my veranda on a typical morning, early morning sunrise. Very, very lovely place. I hope you all can come and visit someday.
Ooh. 